Chapter 20. Behind the Curtain. Can I do something for you? Or to you? Failure. I couldn't save Matiri Jack. I couldn't stop Steelhooves from murdering Chief Grimstar. I was letting down my friends and everyone who needed me. The realization of what I was had been doing to those closest to me with my damn addiction cut deep. And, as much as I wanted to rage at Velvet Remedy, it was my fault that when Shuri Dak was dead. I'd killed him with a mint. Actually, I'd killed him with a whole lot of them. I'd been eating them like... Damn it. They actually tasted like candy. How fucking wrong is that? I was physically exhausted and mentally overwhelmed on the verge of crying. It took me a long time to pull myself up off the floor and make my way back. The basement was huge, cluttered, maze-like. I took a wrong turn and found myself in a room full of spark power generators, half of which were running, making the whole room seem a throb. A bank of them on the far wall were burning and blackened their metal skins ruptured. One exploded generator was randomly sparking, making the air taste like lightning. The skeleton of a pony, severed in two by hunks of metal shrapnel, rested forever on the floor a few yards away from them. An engineering schematic on the wall told me these had been the generators which powered the Ministry's magical defenses. They had given their lives, saving the building and its inhabitants from the Manhattan Balefire Bomb. Well, all except for one very unlucky maintenance pony. I wonder what his, or her, name had been. Did the pony have a family? Did they know what happened? All moot 200 years later. Just one more tear. I backtracked, and finally found my way to the exit. As I stepped out through the basement doorway, I was greeted by two of Ten Pony Towers guard ponies. <clears throat> Little Pip, you need to come with us. I stared at them, then back to the open basement door. Was I being arrested? A weight sunk in my heart. They must think that I was responsible for the disappearance of Chief Grimstar. That was fast. But then, I had been running around like a mad pony earlier, and here I was leaving the scene of the crime. Because today, just couldn't get any worse. I nodded to the guards, saying nothing, and let them escort me to the constable's office. I'd been here before, and I wondered if any of the ponies I had placed Sigdustris on in order to get to the private audience of Monterey Jack would be there. They wouldn't need to execute me. I could simply die from embarrassment. One thing for sure, I wasn't going to say anything. I knew what Steel Hoofs had done, but what would be the use of pointing a hoof? I'd learned that lesson with Monteri Jack. Ponies turned to stare as they marched me through Ten Pony Constabulary. I could half hear the whispers that followed in my passing. I recognized a few of the guards on duties, including the one I had sweet talked into giving me his pencil so I could write down all the ideas for my party time mental fuel brain had been devising. I dropped my head, wanting to crawl. I glanced up as we passed several guard ponies, talking with steel hooves. From the look of things, he was here of his own volition. That did not bode well. In here, please, one of the escorts demanded. To my surprise, the door swung open, and it wasn't a cell, but a nice-looking office, paneled in fake wood and full of bookshelves. Take a seat, and don't wander off. Some pony will be with you shortly. I looked to him in confusion. Sorry about the delays. We've had a situation with the chief. You're not our first priority today. I was so weary that I sank under the little couch in the office and didn't move, waiting for what seemed like hours. I checked my pit buck. It was getting late. I was hungry and confused. 
There was a small radio on the desk corner. I turned it on, wanted to lose myself in DJ Pontree's music. Instead, I was shocked to hear Steelhoof's deep voice rumble from the box. I'm no hero. If you're looking for a hero, look to Chief Grimstar. He bravely sacrificed himself to save all of you. I only wish I could have saved him. Sheriff Rotten Rottentail had been gathering a variable army of zombie ponies in the maintenance tunnels surrounding Ten Pony Tower. There is a door in the basement through which Sheriff was going to unleash them upon the innocent residents of the tower. It would have been a slaughter. The Talons, hired by the chief, learned of this threat, but were not pleased with how things went down. When I encountered the Talons, there were considerably fewer of them than when Chief Grimstar hired them, so they neglected to inform the chief of any of this, leaving all of your lives in jeopardy. When I found the chief, he insisted we go down to investigate the Talon's story. We found the door and ventured through with the intention of making sure that it could not be opened from the outside. We were destroying the terminal that controlled the door access from the maintenance tunnels when the zombie ponies attacked us in mass. Only my armor saved me. I still remember Grimstar's last words, ordering me to flee, close the door, and make sure I was disabled it was disabled from the outside of the tower as well. He stayed back, fighting to the bitter end, sacrificing himself to give me the time I needed to make sure Ten Pony Tower, Ten Pony Tower was, and is, safe. I stared at the radio. By Celestia's mane, he was actually going to pull this off, wasn't he? There was so much truth woven into the story that it would hold up to investigation. And the only point he questioned it would be questioning the heroism of Chief Grimstar. I knew different, but I was the only one. It'd be my word against his. My very non-citizen word. Not that I would say anything. I already made the mistake of going down that path. DJ Pontree's voice was now on the radio. From an interview about an hour ago with one of my faithful assistants, the Ten Pony Constabulary has confirmed the Steel Ranger's tale based on a computer entry left by Chief Grimstar. Oh, wait. Was that why he trotted here? My lockpicking skills seemed virtually unique, but I doubted my ability to hack a terminal it was nearly so rare. And if anybody could do it, who was more likely than a knight of the Ministry of Technology? It was just a guess, a suspicion, but it struck me that Steelhoof was covering his bases. Part of me almost admired what he was capable of. Part of me was angry that he was using Homage's broadcast, dedicated to the truth of the wasteland, no matter how bad it hurt, to spread his lies. I turned off the radio. Some pony finally arrived to speak with me. The Dubonair Gentle Stallion who took his place on the other side of the desk was a brown unicorn with glasses perched on his nose and a scroll for a cutie mark. <clears throat> Sorry to keep you waiting. Let's get down to business, shall we? I nodded, glumly. I was no longer curious why I was here. I just wanted to get whatever it was over with so I could go. The unicorn levitated several scrolls onto the desk and opened them. Now, you should be aware that there are expenses that have to be accounted for. The cost of the rope used to hang Monterey Jack was 30 bottle caps. Fine stuff, premium made. Cost for the executioner was 25 bottle caps. Then there are the cremation expenses. The stallion looked over his glasses at me. Unless, of course, you'd rather just throw his body into the street for the birds. His tone suggested that would be looked on as uncivilized, but that he was required to give me the option. Cremation itself is 100 caps, plus an additional 57 for the basic box. I stared with dawning comprehension. I was going to have to pay for Monteri Jack's execution? I was dumbfounded. How many Questria did that make sense? 
But I thought as I sank into desperation. It made sense. It was my fault that he was dead. Why shouldn't I have to pay for it? I listened to Sprightly as the list of fees and expenses and legal charges grew and grew. One year's rent for both the cheese shop and his private quarters amounted to 7,200 bottle caps. Altogether, required expenses and fees amount to a total of 9,047 bottle caps. I stared vacantly for a moment, then nodded. With a sigh, I asked, How long do I have to pay for this? I don't have that kind of money. As a group, we had easily more than double that, but I couldn't feel right about draining such a huge amount of the bottle caps from what was Calamity and Velvet Remedy's money as well. Steel Hoofs too, although I felt a less pang about that. The gentle stallion just blinked at me. Perfect. By their standards, I was poor. I mean, I could pay about half of it now. Giving me an odd look, the stallion informed me. It's already been taken into the accounts. Out of the accounts. Unfortunately, Monterey Jack didn't have significant funds to pay for it. All of his caps. So a fair amount of personal property was confiscated. For auction, in accordance to... He droned off. Legally. That went completely over my mane. Confusion scrambled my thoughts. So I didn't have to pay for Monterey Jack's execution? Then why pull me in here and tell me all this? Did they just assume I wanted to know? So I could gloat? Was I legally required to gloat? The gentle stallion was staring at me again. A frown broke across his face. Well, I just lost that bet. He muttered to himself. Then addressing me, You have no idea why you're here, do you? I shook my head. Monterey Jack was convinced convicted of attempted banditry. You were the pony he tried to rob. Therefore, upon his death, all of his properties are legally yours. What? Wait, what? It was bad enough that I thought I was being punished. I had made peace with that because I deserved no less for my stupidity and failure. Now, I was being rewarded for it? No. The world did not get to be that fucked up. I refused to let it. The stallion considered me. Honestly, there are a number of ponies who suspected that Monterey Jack's confession might have been more from the magic of your horn than the weight on his conscience, he informed me. I remembered the whispering as I passed by. Of course they did. Any pony who knew about this twisted bit of legalist would suspect me. Even I hadn't been able to comprehend why Monterey Jack had confessed until I'd taken and talked with him privately. The legal stallion continued. I personally had laid good caps that this was some sort of plot cooked up between you and Monterey Jack. Again, he frowned. Clearly not. I started at that. What? He died. What kind of plan would that have been? The stallion shrugged. We all know Monteri Jack hasn't been right since his wife died. After Clarinet was killed, I'm all they have left. Clarinet, right? I asked, and the legal stallion nodded. He mentioned his wife. What happened to her? There's a rumor that she... that there's an untouched stable somewhere in Fetlock. A few months back, they were trying to find it. Never did. No pony has. My heart sank. It was absurd to feel guilty for having found Stable 29 myself, wasn't it? She was killed by a manticore, according to Materi Jack. He killed the thing, but not before it had stung them both and torn her up right bad. The poor fellow only had enough antivenom for one, and she insisted he use it himself. With her wounds, according to Materi, she probably wouldn't have made it even if they had given it to her. The stallion shook his head. Of course, that's just how Monteri told it. I've never known the stallion to lie before. Sweet merciful Celestia. 
The legal stallion cleared his throat and turned back to the documents in front of him. Returning to the matter at our hooves, even after fees and deductions, you were still left with the private quarters, the deed, and business license to the shop, and a modest amount of home furnishings. Of course, there are two matters which we must attend to. This was so wrong. I couldn't be gaining property from Ontario Jack's tragedy. I just... I couldn't accept this. I didn't deserve this. First, of course, is the simple fact that you are not a citizen of Ten Pony Tower. And as such, you are not permitted to operate a business within the tower. Normally, it takes several years to earn citizenship. But, with the legal standing of those properties, if you started applications now, you could possibly achieve citizenship within little more than a year. He looked over his glasses, fixing me with a stare. Still, it is this office's recommendation that you sell off the deeds and businesses' right, rights to the shop to some mayor or gentle colt who is a citizen. Make yourself a tidy little sum and be done with it. I nodded. I wonder if Homage had any use for an ex-cheese shop. Second is the matter of Monterey Jack's children. My ears shot up. What was this? Who are legally allowed to remain in the private quarters until the end of the month. So, while you do legally own the property, I'm afraid you won't be able to kick them out until the first of... I felt like I'd been hit by a piano. By the twisted legal fuckery of Ten Pony Tower, I was the one bucking Monterey Jack's fillies and colts into the dead wasteland. I felt I was seeing behind a curtain. Monterey Jack's execution made me the hero when his children worshipped into the pony stealing their homes from them just after their father had died. The ultimate buck when they're down. Unless, of course, I did something about it. Exactly like I had done already. I'd taken care of them even before this trap had snapped shut. I looked up at the stallion as a new feeling burned away my depression. Anger. He played me! I screamed at the walls of my suite, telekinetically turning over all the beds. My eyes were burning with tears, my heart pounding with rage. He set me up! I made the blankets tornado around the room. I was a goody four-shoes filly he knew he could manipulate, and he was right. I stomped on all hooves. The blanket soared at the window and rebounded off the glass. I hated Monteri Jack. I wanted him dead, but he was already dead. And I wasn't some pony who would change her mind and take out my frustrations on his children. He was so right about me. So instead, I took my fury out on the room and was thankful that none of my companions were around to see me do it. It was too much. The shame of my addiction, the pain of how it hurt I had hurt my friends, the betrayal of Velvet Remedy's actions, and now Monteri Jack's four-hoofed fucking me from beyond the grave. I hurled one of my saddlebags against the wall. If levitation could have any real force behind it, I probably would have punched a hole in the room. As it was, the saddlebag just clanked against the wall, opening and spilling its contents. A lifetime's worth of party-time mentals rained down from the floor the stash from Pinkie Pie's safe. I started the pile of tins, frozen in place. It only took a moment to transfer all of my rage and sorrow onto the drugs. Before I knew it, I was in the bathroom, dumping tin after tin into the toilet water, cursing them and myself for everything that had been done to my life together. Flush. There went months worth. Flush. There went dozens more. I was throwing away countless bottle caps worth of them, and good riddance. They would never have a chance to hurt any pony else. Flush. There went what I allowed myself to become dependent on. Flush. What I had left, or let come between me and ponies who were closer to me than my family had ever been. I was crying so hard, I could barely see what I was doing. But I didn't need to. Flush. Flush flush. 
The last tin of party time mentals floated in front of me, hovering over the toilet, open. I just had to tilt it and flush. Easiest thing in the world. Telekinetic child's play. A tilt and a flush. The tin hovered there, not tilting. The last tin. For all the damage they had done, that I had let them do, Partisan Mintals had saved my life and the lives of my friends more than once. Should I keep just one tin? Just in case? But if I took even one more, I could become addicted again. It only took one the first time, and I couldn't do that to myself. I wasn't Monteri Jack. I wasn't willing to screw myself over like that. The tin started to tip. But what if that mental clarity was the only thing which could save my friends? What if Calamity's white life was on the line? Or Velvet Remedies? Or Steel Hooves? Wouldn't they be worth the sacrifice of myself? Yes. Yes, they would. The tin leveled and began, began floating back towards me. But could I do that to them? Put them through it all again? I wouldn't it be a betrayal to even keep one tin? The tin stopped, floating above the lip of the toilet. Little Pip? Homage's voice startled me from the bathroom doorway. My magic imploded, dropping the tin into the toilet, metal case and all. I looked at her, startled, eyes red and puffy, knowing I looked completely like an ugly mess. Homage stepped into the bathroom, looking peaceful and elegant in her dress. I cringed back, not wanting to actually eventually touch it with my filthy body. She didn't let me get away. She grabbed me, pulled me against her breast. I couldn't contain myself anymore. I broke into open weeping. I heard the metal tin as Homage lifted it out of the toilet and dropped it onto a pile with all the others. Flush. At some point, Homage nudged me from my suite up to the Anathenium where she lived. She played soft music and stayed close to me, leaving DJ Pwn 3's broadcast on a newsless loop of songs. How long before this makes the news cycle? I asked wearily as the sun was beginning to set. Homage gave me a gentle but reproachful look. Toaster repair pony kicks addiction? More at the top of the hour? The pretty gray unicorn gave me a nudge with her nose. Really? I don't think that's something for the airwaves, do you? I smiled gratefully to her. Let me cook you something to eat, Homage said before she dared leaving my side. I realized how badly I was starving. I hadn't eaten for the better part of two days. Homage put to shame the restaurants of Ten Pony Tower with their woven fried banana puree and whatnot. Simple, delicious cooking. And she didn't mind cooking more when I finished off everything and was still hungry. After dinner, I was feeling tired and emotionally drained, not to mention very full. But I now had enough energy to help her clean up. Where did you learn to cook like that? I asked wishing we had someone with even half her skill traveling with us. I was sorely tempted to suggest she join us, and not just for her food, but I knew she was needed here. All of the equestrian wasteland depended on DJ Pwn3. My delinquent youth, she hinted with a wink. I pressed her with a hoof, and she elaborated. I really was the assistant to the last DJ Pwn3. That's how I took up the mantle when he fell ill. I was the only one who knew him. The magic voice spell had been passed down for at least five DJ Pwn3s, and the Wasteland never knows there's been a change. I nodded, having suspected as much. I spent several years 
after getting that cutie mark, running around the Manhattan ruins and beyond with Joke Blue, a close friend. The friend, I realized, that she had mentioned before. The area between here and Philadelphia wasn't as deadly then as it is now. I hunted for recordings and memory orbs to give to DJ Pon3 in the hopes that they would have new music or useful news for the broadcasts. Did other errands for DJ Pon3. Earned my way into the tower. Learned how to survive along the way. Cooking, weapon maintenance, and a lot of practice hacking computers to get into locked doors and safes. I thought of all the hacking and lockpicking I had done, driven largely by curiosity and the need to explore and to know, even if what I learned didn't mean anything. Like keeping a memory was an acknowledgement of and tribute to the past. Joke Blue was the only one who knew her way around weapons and had the skill to disarm traps. Homage trailed off, clearly a painful memory for her. Do you want to talk about it? Homage smiled, a tear in her eye. Most traps. Some cruel bastard rigged up a baby carriage with explosives, used the corpse of a newborn colt and a recording of a baby crying to lure victims in. I cringed, horrified. By the time she was close enough to realize the baby was dead, it was too late to run. She tried to disarm it, but... The dear unicorn's voice broke off, choked. Now it was my turn to hold homage. I stretched out on homage's bed as she gave me a massage. Either she had learned a lot from our visit to the spa, or she had practice. Either way, it was wonderful. If I was a cat, I would have been purring. I felt her press against me as she leaned close and whispered into my ear. I know you're under doctor's orders to relax and not exert yourself. You listen about as well as most of his patients. I nodded, not wanting to really talk about that, or really about anything else. What she was doing with her hooves was divine, and maybe she was pressing them in circles against the back of my legs and at the base of my rump. Not as skilled as the professional spa ponies, maybe, but unspeakably more delightful because it was homage doing it. So, I won't apologize for helping you break them further. I had no idea what she was- Oh, hello! I gasped as I felt her tongue someplace I'd only imagined it before. Pleasure burst through my whole body. And she was just getting started. This was definitely going to qualify as strenuous activity. I sat, startled. My gaze drawn to the dark window. Beside me, Hamid stirred in the bed, opening an eye as she magically lifted or shifted the covers. Little Pip? She questioned, sleepishly. I told her I thought I'd seen a flash of green outside the window. It reminded me of the flash I'd noticed in the fog nearly a week ago. Probably just a balefire phoenix, Homage dismissed, nuzzling close. There are several of them in Manhattan. Yeah, I nodded. But I think this one has been following us. We spent the next morning together. Homage left the bed long enough to cook his breakfast. And then, again, a couple hours later, to poke around in the emergency broadcast station above us. The news this time included a retelling of my brave and daring rescue of Blackwing's talons, including congratulations from DJ Pone 3 on once again stomping two eggs under one hoof. Apparently, I had taken out three alicorns single hoofedly by blowing up a raider compound. I buried my hand, head under the sheets. It shouldn't have surprised me. In fact, I would have been surprised if Calamity hadn't given her the express permission to lay out, to lay that on my hooves. Hodge had proven she really did enjoy making me squirm, every way she could. She was gone for the better part of an hour, 
leaving me through my thoughts. When she returned, I had reluctantly decided to broach an uncomfortable topic. The black opal. That thing? She asked, immediately knowing what I was talking about. I expected her to ask why I wanted it, but instead, how did you know I had one of those things? I bit my lip. Uh, an acquaintance wants me to procure it. I looked away, and then back into her eyes. I was very tempted to tell the pony to just fuck off, but I figured I would ask. Please, feel free to say no. I don't want anything to come between us right now. Or, ever, really. Hums regarded me for a painful moment, then smirked. Dear, the only thing coming between us for the last several hours has been sweat. But even I had to attend to business. So as much as I wanted to slack off, I'm not going to begrudge you for doing the same. I breathed a sigh of relief. And yes, you can have it. She caught my eyes with an earnest glaze. I have a gift for you too. But the black opal, think of it as a down payment. I have a quest for you, and I want to hire you for it. My eyes widened with surprise. Anything. She laughed. You might not say that after I tell you what it is, but you and your friends, you're planning on heading towards Philadelphia, aren't you? The laughter in her voice died as she spoke that name. I nodded firmly. I'm still convinced that something is escalating in the equestrian wastelands. Something involving Red Eye and the Alicorns. I know they've been around for quite a while, I told her. Long enough for Steel Hooves to become known to the monsters as the almighty Alicorn Hunter. Sarcastically, at least. Questioning my theory. The Alicorns have been around a long time. Right? But I'm guessing they've gotten a lot more common. How much considered that? Hadn't even heard of them ten years ago. Now they're all over the place in Canterlot. And this last year, I noticed groups of them showing up in Manhattan, too. I nodded again. When I uncover what's going on, DJ Pwn3 will be the first to know. I promised. And all of Equestria will know soon after. Homage swore. Although, I might get a foreleg up on you. I suspected the innuendo was intentional. If you complete this not-so-little task for me, do you remember that bank of blank screens in the EBS? I had taken note of them when she first allowed me inside of the MAS EBS. And let me look around. I told her so. Those are the feeds from the Philadelphia Tower. Red Eye has taken control of that tower, or at least 3% of the tower that I normally have access to, and locked me out of it. If you're going that way, I want you to attach an override to the mainframe in the tower station. That way, it'll allow DJ Pwn3 to finally have eyes in that horrible place. Red Eye has operated long enough in the shadows. I pot a hoof down, although stomping a pillow didn't really have nearly the same effect. Agreed. Homage pulled down the picture of Splendid Valley, revealing a wall safe with a door made of thickly armored glass. It opened for her magic with a click. There were three items inside, two of which she floated out, giving to me. The first was the black opal. I gazed at the item, full of memories that Watcher wanted so badly. I wanted to give this to you as a gift, Homage said, with a soft smile and a warm but insistent voice, as she floated out the bright pink statuette of a very familiar pony. I had never seen Pinkie Pie look so young and so alive. I half expected the statuette to jump up, animated by the sheer energy of her expression, and start bouncing around the room. This, I realized, was the real Pinkie Pie. Twilight's Pinkie Pie. In comparison, the mare I had seen in the memory seemed like a shadow. It was a gift given to me from the previous DJ Pwn3. 
who got it from the one before him. I'm told it was given to the original DJ Home 3 Vinyl Scratch by the mayor of the Ministry of Morale herself. The figurine gave off such an aura of unbridled happiness, but I couldn't imagine any pony's morale sagging around her. It has served me well, and now I want to give it to you. I looked at Homage, feeling a startled reluctance. I couldn't. This was an heirloom. It was... I know what you've been through, and I know that Shay went through it too. You... you beat it. She didn't. I don't want you to have this, as a reminder. It's something to look at any time you feel the urge to bite down on another mintal. I swallowed hard. I nodded solemnly, understanding the gravity of this gift. I reached out with my magic, wrapping the little pinky pie in a telekinetic stealth, and immediately felt a jolt. Everything became clearer. My body became more alive. It was more than a little like biting into a menthol, but it tasted like candy apples and cupcake frosting. What did? Part of my mind insisted. It wasn't like I had put anything in my mouth. Between the twilight statuette and Pinkie Pie, I felt almost like I was on mentals without them. Only cleaner, better, more wholesome. I turned the statuette around to read the base. It didn't match the others. Of course, it wouldn't match the others. Awareness! It was under E! I felt joyous and heartbroken at the same time. The statuette was a reminder both of what I had done wrong and of the cost had I not been pulled from the abyss by my friends. A sorrowful acknowledgement of the damage I had done and now I needed to repair. And a messenger telling me that I had the strength to not do it again. And perhaps most of all, a keepsake from homage, letting me know she understood my weakness and acceptance with acceptance and forgiveness. Thank you, homage. This means more than you can know. I floated it into my saddlebags, which homage had apparently floated up here with us while I was too emotionally out of it to notice. I opened one of the flaps to the pouch which held the three other statuettes. I took a piece of cloth and tied Pinkie Pie next to Twilight. Now, they could be together again. It was silly, but it just felt right. As Homage closed the safe, I took notice of the last item mounted inside the safe. It was some sort of magical energy pistol, but not of any make I had ever seen, and with a grip that wouldn't fit in any pony's mouth. Curiosity sparked, and I asked Homage about it. Long story, she told me. One night, Joke Blue and I were poking our hooves around Fetlock, trying to find a stable we'd heard rumors about, when there was a strange explosion that lit up the clouds above. At first, we thought it was thunder, but then all sorts of debris started running out of the skies. Chunks of the strangest sky wagons you'd ever seen see ever laid eyes on. We took cover in a burned out passenger wagon. When it was over, I found the thing amongst the rubble. Homage chuckled. Okay, maybe not that long of a story. What is it? Nastiest magical gun the equestrian wasteland has ever seen to my knowledge. One shot from that thing, and it'll turn whatever hit it into vapor. It's not like the magical energy weapons you've seen, which can do that thing only once in a blue moon. Every single time. Homage actually sounded scared of the gun. I believe you could kill a dragon with one shot from the thing. And with those words, so did I. Where did it come from? I wondered aloud. The idea that were, there were ponies, the pegasi maybe, with weapons that devastating, chilled me. Tail to four hooves. Joke Blue figured it was some sort of flying tank the pegasi were experimenting with that blew up on them. Me, Homage swallowed. 
I know I'm being foolish, but I can't help but think it fell from a lot higher than that. Higher? I had the strange mental image of items falling into Equestria from the moon, emptying from Nightmare Moon's toy chest. Homage looked a bit embarrassed. You'll laugh. I promised I wouldn't, and resolved not to, no matter how hard it was. The beautiful, sexy gray pony took a moment to gather her thoughts, then started cautiously. I once met a zebra. That, I wasn't expecting her to say at all. My ears shot up, and I leaned forward. They don't have the same relationship to the sky that we do. Obviously, since they have no pegasi. But it's more than that. Before the apocalypse, we ponies had always looked to the sky with a sense of joy and safety. We saw the sun, guided by the sky, uh, through the sky by Celestia by the day, and the moon, Luna's charge, keeping an eye on us during the night. Princess Celestia and Princess Luna were our benevolent, benevolent rulers, and even though most ponies never met them personally, the sun and the moon were symbols of their kind presence wherever and to every pony in Equestria. I felt my body lean closer, why not to catch every word of this? I'd never heard Celestia and Luna spoken of this way. When they perished in the apocalypse, and the Pegasi closed off the sky, stealing the sun and the moon from us, we turned them into deities to keep them always with us. Even those trapped underground in the stables seemed to do so. A sort of parallel evolution. What she was saying was almost blasphemous, but I bucked away the desire to admonish her, leaning precariously closer to hear. Homage had perceived that I wanted to hear, even if I possibly wouldn't have listened to it from any pony else. She made me wonder, ask questions. For instance, will this explain why Calamity did not believe in the goddesses? Why atheism, a Pegasus trait? Unlike us, they had never lost the embrace of the sun or the moon. The zebras, though, they cringe from the sky, Homage said. The statement was something I would not have expected from a propaganda poster. Not a pony who had learned this directly from a zebra. But I knew Homage, and it would not be like her to speak objective truth as she knew it. The zebra look up and see the stars staring down at us from a great black emptiness. And the stars, they know, are not benevolent. I leaned further, tipped over, and fell on my face. Homage stopped, covering a chuckle with her hoof. When I'd gotten back up, probably looking as sheepishly as I felt, she continued. There is intelligence up there, the zebras believe, from the stars themselves. The stars burn with cold, malicious fire. No number of them could warm the sky at night. They wish ill on our world. And sometimes they will act, not against us directly, but to enable us to harm and ruin ourselves. I opened my muzzle and suggested that the zebras were a bit batty dying on my lips. Yes, it sounds insane, but didn't we have legends that suggested the same? I recall the story of the Mare in the Moon, the real version, not that stallion on the moon nonsense. The stars will aid her escape. In particular, they tell of four malevolent stars with hearts of cruelty and chaos, which yearn to taste our pain and destruction, wrought by our hooves. With a grimace, Homage added, If there's any truth to the zebra mythology, I'd guess we've gone, or we've given them quite the banquet. Four stars, helping destroy Equestria. And now, why did that sound familiar? Homage shrugged off the eerie atmosphere that had settled in the room by her tail. Anyway, like I said, foolish. 
Joke Blue was probably right. Some Pegasus experiment that blew it up in their face. Cautiously, how much on my side? I lowered my horn towards the black opal. If I was going to give this to Watcher, I wanted to know what it was first. It was only reluctantly that I touched the opal with my magic and let it take homage and her Athenium away from me. I felt strangely wrong. We were in the darkened hallways, wide and elaborately decorated, walking towards a brightly lit room with a decorative curtain partition hiding half of it. There were four ponies walking in front of me, a fifth leading the way. The mayors of the ministries. The first pony I recognized was Pinkie Pie, while the other pony was walking separately through the halls. She was bouncing like a fan filly on her way to her next idol's performance. The pony was a little younger than I'd seen her before. The candy cane look was still going strong though. I felt a pang of deep embarrassment as my gaze fell on the lead pony, a beautiful white unicorn I had fantasized about. And the pony I was riding just wouldn't stop staring. Celestia's solar flaring mare heat. The creature I was riding wasn't a pony. He, and he was definitely an unbearingly a he, was as big as a stallion. I felt things that were not hooves at the end of my legs, and wings fold on my back, and a tail. Spike, Fluttershy asked timidly, turning around and looking at me. Does that hurt? My attention was drawn to something tight and metal squeezing my hand. The recollector, I assumed. It did not seem to be designed for whatever I was. I opened my mouth, which felt all wrong, and answered, Nah, I barely feel a thing. Besides, Rarity wanted a memory of this. She could have worn it herself, Twilight Sparkle muttered under her breath from directly in front of me. I saw my eyes go once again to the white unicorn with the perfect purple mane. She didn't seem to hear it, but engaged in conversation with the pony I knew to be Applejack. The orange pony with the three apple cutie mark looked a little younger and not as weary as she had at Pinkie Pie's last party. I sure hope this ain't nothing to do with that thing we never talked about, Applejack was saying with a nervous caution. Oh no, dear. I gave that project up ages ago, Rowdy replied with graceful dictation. Oh, the orange pony sighed with clear relief. Good. As we approached, we walked across a fancy carpet woven with gemstones. I felt a cold shock as the creature I was riding stepped over it. Twilight Sparkle had stopped just ahead and turned an eye to the carpet, as Rarity and Applejack talked. But her attention was drawn by Rarity loudly clearing her throat. Fluidly, Rarity shifted the subject, speaking up to address all four ponies she was leading. Now, this really is just a first design, but I think you'll all be very impressed. Always thrilled to see one of your designs, Rarity, Twilight Sparkle encouraged. Rarity smiled with businesslike thankfulness. And this is just the light suit, not the fully powered version, she turned to Applejack, a smiling demeanor. And I do want to make it clear that I'm not trying to step on your hooves here. This armor isn't as strong as your Steel Ranger suits. It doesn't offer quite the protection. Then what's the point? Applejack interrupted. I don't see the use in creating armor that's less protective. The group had reached the end of the hallway. There was a large mirror to one side of the room, and the other was filled with sewing machines, bolts of cloth, and dress ponies. Designs and schematics covered the walls, and at Rarity's motion, they stopped, each turning her attention towards the partition, except for my alien ride, who only had eyes for the white unicorn. Well, 
because there is more to an outfit than just how well it stops bullets, of course. Applejack looked ready to disagree strongly, but bit back her comment. Okay, Rainbow Dash? Rarity called out. They're ready for you. Around the curtain partition stepped the shadow out of the nightmare. The blue Pegasus pony, who was encased in a black insectoid carapace, with only the front of her muzzle and the underside of her wings showing. Her tail was hidden with a scorpion-like sheath with a vicious barbed stinger. The ebony suit of armor was sleek and wicked. Yellow-orange protective goggles with a bug-like compound eye pattern completed the look. Built into the side of the suits were antenna-like protrusions. The crystals that tipped those magical energy weapons shimmered with shifting rainbow light. The reactions of the other ponies were immediate. Eee! Woo, Nelly! That looks demonic. Ooh, Dashy, you look scary! The creature I was riding turned to watch Rarity suddenly take off. Fluttershy, come back! It's only Rainbow Dash! I, we, turned back to see Rainbow Dash pushing the goggles with one armored hoof. Her eyes narrowed, a smirk running across her muzzle as she lowered her body into a menacing battle stance in front of the mirror. She growled menacingly, the armor making her look positively sinister. Oh yeah, she said, this is cool. Reality reasserted itself, leaving me feeling very strange. I was glad to be back on my own hooves. I didn't ever want to be that thing again. Still have approached me as I trotted across Ten Point Towers Monorail Station. You're headed to meet that Spidebot friend of yours, right? I nodded, eyeing the armored concealed warrior. Watcher? He said, surprising me. You know Watcher? I blurted out, then mentally bucked myself in the head. I had to remember to start actually talking and asking Steelhooves questions. I know of Watcher. Steelhooves intoned. You don't live as long as we have without crossing each other in these wakes. It took me a moment to phrase what had been said. But then I nodded. So, Watcher really has been along for around a long, around for a long time. Who is Watcher? And what is she or he or it doing? Who? I couldn't tell you. Steelhooves lifted a foreleg, looking to it. Watcher lets ponies know less about Watcher than I let them know about me. Now with good reason. He put his hoof down. As for what, Watcher has a habit of finding ponies with, a uh, who are... I wasn't aware I was staring at him until Steelhooves returned the stare. Watcher finds ponies who are better ponies and sets them on a path to find others. To create teams of friends. I found myself feeling nervous. I didn't like the look at my adventures from the outside like that. And then? Well, most of the time they disappear or end up dead. That was not comforting. Still have stayed behind the station as I trotted out alone on the Celestia line. I didn't have far to go. The monorail curved around a ruined building. Ten Pony Tower disappeared from sight. And there was Watcher. The Sprite Bot floated silently, waiting. I have it, I said flatly. Thank you, little Pip. I knew I could trust you. Now, the Sprite Bot has a compartment for spare batteries. If you could just... No. The Sprite Bot floated silently for a moment. Huh? Watcher sounded perplexed. Trust goes two ways, right? I challenged. Well, yes. I relayed your message, just like you asked. Before, you got the black opal. I nodded. It made sense, but not what I was after. Not now. I felt a fierce determination set in. Answer is still no. No? You got it, 
But you're not going to give it to me? Oh, I'm going to give it to you, I said forcibly. In person. Watcher felt silent. This time, I didn't wait for a response. You talk about virtues and friendship. Well, friends don't run away every time a conversation turns personal. You can't have friends if you hide behind robots and never let any pony see the real you, I snorted. Hell, even Steel Hooves does better than you do. You want this? I want to meet you. Why? Because I want to know if you're actually my friend, or if you're just playing me too. Watcher bobbled, slightly, a moment longer. I wondered just how much the stranger behind the curtain wanted this black opal, with the interesting but seemingly insignificant memory. Then, just as I was convinced that Watcher would tell me to go take a jump off the monorail, the toneless mechanical voice said, Fine. I blinked. It was the response I wanted, but... You're right, little pip. I heard a beep from my foreleg. I've uploaded my location onto your pit buck. I'll see you soon. It was a burst of static, and the sprite bot floated away on a drum solo. I lifted my leg to look at my pit buck. There was an icon on my equestrian map, far, far away from Manhattan, in the middle of nowhere. It would take weeks to travel there on hoof. But if Watcher thought this would dissuade me, or even delay me, then Watcher was wrong. I had spent one more night in Ten Pony Tower with homage, after which, sadly, it was time to leave. Our first stop was Fetlock. Calamity spent several hours underneath the Sky Bandit, installing the flux regulator and making sure everything was working in working order. By the time it was done, it was getting rapidly dark. I've got good news, ponies, he said as he crawled out, looking greasy. We got ourselves transportation. Velvet Remedy, Steel Hooves, and I stomped in thunderous applause. Now this beauty is powered off an array of spark batteries, and the last two centuries ain't been kind, so we'll have to swap them out pretty regularly to keep her running. Wait, Velvet Remedy said with alarm. Do you mean this death trap's ability to stay afloat behind you could cut out at any moment? Calamity looked at her almost sympathetically. Nah, she'll start to sag first, become hard to steer. We'll have plenty of warning. And, I assured Velvet Remedy, if that happens, I think my telekinesis is strong enough by now to keep us going long enough to land safely. There is no way I could lift that much for a prolonged period. Not enough to travel anywhere, at least. But, I was completely confident that I could keep us aloft, even if the spark batteries died, and Calamity fell asleep, for a few minutes. The others began to gather inside the Sky Bandit. Already, Velvet Remedy was cleaning it with her magic, and discussing how to decorate it. Neither of the boys seemed inclined to participate. I floated out a spoon and a can of sweet potatoes, opening it. I was hungry again, and I intended to, to eat lunch as I planned the next three moves. With the Sky Bandit, we could be on Watcher's doorstep in less than two days. Uh, little Pip? Calamity called out. Are you going to hang out there in the rain? I paused. A spoonful of sweet potatoes lifted halfway to my mouth. What? It's not. Boom! Thunder cracked directly overhead, and water came down, as if some pony had turned on a giant faucet directly above me. I was soaked in an instant, my hair sagging over my face. The can filled with water, floating chunks of sweet potato out onto the ground. Leave it to a pegasus pony to know. Tossing aside the can, now mostly full of water, I galloped into the shelter of the passenger wagon. Clemity and Velvet Remedy took shelter behind steel hooves, as I shook hard, flinging water everywhere. There was a beautiful, piercing cry, and the Balefire Phoenix swooped out, went in and out of the rain through a shattered window. It landed on the seat next to Velvet Remedies, whose eyes went wide. 
she let out a squeal of delight. You've named her Pyrelite? Steelhooves asked, echoing my thoughts as Velvet fed the bird before curling up under her own blanket. We've been traveling through the air for a day now, and ever since the cloudburst ended, the Balefire Phoenix had remained with us, or more precisely, with Velvet Remedy. I personally found the name a little morbid. It made me wonder about my friend. We took turns sleeping and watching, passing around my binoculars. So far, nothing has shot at us. By now, we had a good idea where we were headed. It was hard to miss the giant mountains jutting up over Equestria, like one of those spire towers. Once Steelhooves was certain Velvet Remedy was deep asleep, she stepped over and whispered in my ear, you should persuade her to spend less time in that memory orb. I looked at Velvet Remedy. In the last 16 hours, she disappeared into this Fluttershy memory twice. It was like she had an addiction of her own. That's not a good memory, Steelhoos mumbled, surprising me. I looked to him, wondering how a non-unicorn could know what the memory was. As if reading my thoughts, he answered bemusedly. I asked her. Oh. I felt like face hoofing. What's wrong with that memory? Fluttershy wasn't like the others. Rainbow Dash wanted to win the war. Applejack just wanted to protect other ponies. Especially after Big Macintosh died. Twilight Sparkle wanted to please the princesses, especially Celestia. Still lives intoned. But Fluttershy just wanted the war to end. That memory is the moment she put her whole ministry to that purpose, finding a way to end the conflict. And she did. I felt a shudder. In a world where not everyone is sane, it is the height of insanity to believe you could create a weapon so devastating, so horrible, that no one would dare to use it. Oh no. I looked at Velvet Remedy as she slept. The same urge that made me discard the memory ord from Horsehoof Tower returned, growing in order of magnitude. She loved Fluttershy, modeled herself after the sweet, shy Yellow Pegasus pony. She could never learn this. Wait, I said slowly. You said no one? His odd word choice reminded me of my conversation with Watcher. Steelhoofs answered dreadfully. Perhaps the one thing more insane than believing such a weapon would bring peace is creating such a weapon and then giving it to both sides. Steelhoofs turned to me behind his visor's helmet. Helmet's visor. That memory is the beginning of the end of the world. Ultimately, Fluttershy killed us all. We were circling the mountain, pushing upwards. It was night, and Calamity was taking the ascent slow as I guided him with a Pitbuck's map. All right, he called back. I was afraid of this. Looks like your watcher friend lives high enough up this peak that we have to go about above the cloud lever. Cloud level. We could be okay, but, well, it ain't safe traveling above the clouds. At least, nowhere there's civilization above. Every pony was awake, as with Pyrelight. We all nodded, readying ourselves. I had no idea what to expect when we pushed through the cloud cover, but I doubted it would be anything like a cheerful welcoming party with smiles and muffins. Calamity wrapped, flapped his wings, carrying us upward into the cloud curtain. It was like being plunged into a slightly damp fog. All I could see of the rush-colored Pegasus pulling us through the cloud was a hint of his orange tail. A moment later, the sky bandit burst up through the cloud curtain, and the night sky expanded infinitely around us, filled with evil stars. A beautiful full moon hung in the sky behind the mountain peak, silhouetting it like a vertical rib 
in the universe. Velvet Remedy let out an awe-filled, oh, pyrolite, and gave a musical cry. The jaws of vertigo clamped down on me. My legs went weak, and my knees gave out. A rational panic told me I would somehow be sucked out of one of the windows and fall endlessly through the space. Maybe one of the stars would get me. I clutched the side of the passenger wagon and looked down at the clouds. That was much better, and just as beautiful. The clouds were laced with silver from the moonlight, glowing with a gentle, calming light. My eyes, it was under E, spotted a glint of metal on one of the cliffs. I asked Calamity to pull us closer. I had expected it was Watcher, or at least another sprite bot, but instead it was an audio recorder. I floated into the Sky Bandit. This had better not be from Watcher, I said, starting to feel a touch pissed. I don't think so, Calamity said, from in front of the wagon. I slipped the audio recorder away, looking out to spy what he saw. I kicked on my eyes forward sparkle. Just in time to. According to my pit buck, I had just found Dragon Cave. I think maybe your friend sent us up here to get eaten, Velvet Remedy said aloud, staring at the huge, dark opening. The Sky Bandit lay parked on the cliff behind us. Steel Hooves was helping Calamity out of the pulling car harness. The pit buck's data is 200 years old. I assured her nervously. So it was a dragon's cave 200 years ago. Any pony could live in here now. Well, any pony with wings. Anyway. A freed calamity trotted up to join us. Well, y'all planning on waiting outside till the sun comes up? Then, just in case we were, I don't recommend it. Velvet Remedy shook her head. Of course not. Little Pip, you go first. Oh, thanks a lot. I shot her a look. Well, Watcher is your friend. That remained to be seen. I took a step forward. There was a heavy thud from inside. Something moved in the darkness, coming closer. Something big. Ursa Majors didn't grow wings, did they? Velvet Remedy asked nervously making me want to buck her. Hard. I was frightened enough already. A dragon poked his head out of the cave. A huge, gigantic, fully adult dragon who could easily eat two ponies in one bite, even if one of them was steel hooves. Three if two of them were homage and myself. Hello, little pip. I'm Spike, the dragon said in a voice that was neither as terrifying nor booming as I had expected. And don't worry, I'm not going to eat you. Footnote, level up. New perk, Pathfinder. Travel time to remote locations in the Equestrian Wasteland is reduced by 25%. The drain on the Sky Bandit's spark batteries is likewise reduced. Quest perk added, Pony Sutra. You have experienced the art of giving and receiving physical pleasure. You are more likely to have sexual intercourse with specific characters. Really? <laughs> God damn it.